Hi, everybody. I'm Pastor Craig, and I am so glad that you, again, are joining us here wherever you're watching from. If you're at home watching online, I hope that you are encouraged by today's message, but in, as well as challenged. And if you're at one of our campuses, hi there. Glad you could make it. We're in the kind of the tail end now. This is it. I get to land the plane on a cool sermon series called Unstoppable. I don't know if you noticed, but on the slide, there's this little tagline. And this little tagline over here says, the gates of hell will not stand. This is, this is a promise that Jesus makes to his disciples. He says, the gates of hell will not stand. In fact, he says, it is unstoppable. And if you are a follower of Jesus, if you're a part of God's people, this promise says that you are a part of something great, something powerful. You're not just standing uh, cowering, but as the people of God, we are pushing against the gates. We are in enemy territory. We live on the battlefield and we are pushing those gates. They are not gonna stand. That's encouraging. It's exciting to hear about what God will do. But I wanna press in and challenge you a bit today and, and really ask you to evaluate your heart. As I kind of challenge this message, uh, I believe is really meant not only to stir us up, but to get us really focused on the mission of God. And, and it starts a little bit with an understanding. I wanna begin with a reminder of something that we're told about God and his heart for us. And it comes out of 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 9. It says this, that the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. As some understand slowness, instead, he is patient with you and with me. But he's patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. See, this, this movement of God, this unstoppable nature is also filled with the patience of God and his loving heart that none, none would perish. I think we have to start there to understand that God has a mission and a plan. And Pastor Ed started with four really key statements. That first one really is that this unstoppable church is filled with the people of God. Not just anybody, but the people of God, those who say that Jesus is my Lord and my Savior, who surrender their lives to the truth of what God's word says, who he is, that he is God in the flesh. And in that moment, there's this awesome thing that happens. One, your present reality is now added into eternity in heaven with God as you become a part of the people of God. And two, there's this amazing miracle. You're filled with the spirit of God. He says, I will now dwell in you. You can have direct relationship with me. You don't have to go to some temple or through some priest. You can talk directly to me because I'm gonna dwell in you. You will be my temple. And you now are filled with the spirit of God. And this is that promise, that secure guarantee that I am now a part of the church, God's church. And then third, we were told that you're fueled by the power of God because all of this unstoppable nature, it has nothing to do with you or me. We're a part of it. Oh yeah, we're a part. But it's the power of God that is unstoppable and it will prevail and these gates of hell will be destroyed. And finally, to accomplish the mission of God, which we started with, that all would come to repentance, that all would hear of the good news of Jesus Christ and all would come to repentance. And I want to start in 2 Corinthians. So if you want to open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I want to take you into a little story here with the Apostle Paul. So just real quick, if you're just not sure who this guy is, um, historically, you would uh, want to know that he was actually called Saul at one point. And he was a Jewish, really zealous guy. And he was so zealous for God that he was persecuting Christians. And you go, well, wait a minute, I thought God was with the Christians. And well, this was a transition time. Jesus had come, he had lived on earth, he had been crucified, he had been buried, resurrected, and ascended into heaven. And here's now Paul, well, sorry, Saul at the time. He's out and he's killing Christians. And kind of this famous story of Stephen, one of the first recorded martyrs for Jesus. And there's this moment and, and Saul is standing there and he's totally approving the stoning of Stephen. And shortly after that, not only did Stephen die, but at this, uh, at this moment, Stephen looks up and he sees Jesus. It's just such a powerful story. But there's Saul, approval. But on the road of travels, 
Saul comes into this appointment, this, this meeting, and he encounters Jesus. And I, there's this profound statement. It just really impacted me today as I was preparing. In the book of Acts, there's this moment where Saul is confronted by Jesus and he falls to his feet. I mean, his knees, he's just down. And there's this voice and the voice says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? I hadn't really thought about this until today. Stephen was the one who was being persecuted, I thought, when he was being stoned. No, Jesus is saying, every time you persecute, persecute one of my people, you are persecuting me. And at that moment, Paul he gets a new name. And he becomes zealous for God, for serving Christ, and for sharing the gospel. So check this out, what he says. I love this in 2 Corinthians chapter, again, I'm in chapter 11. And I'm going to start at verse 19. Just real quick, he's talking to the church of Corinth, and there's lots of weird stuff going on. There's false apostles, there's deceitful work happening. And he kind of is mocking them a little because they're kind of letting anybody speak in this area. And I love this at verse 19. He says, You gladly put up with fools since you are so wise. In fact, even you put up with anyone who enslaves you or exploits you or takes advantage of you or puts you on airs or slaps you in the face. To my shame, I admit that we were too weak for that. But listen to what he, he goes on there. He's going to explain a little bit here about his passion for Jesus and what he's endured. He says this, Whatever anyone else dared to boast about, and then there's this little, I'm speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast about. And then he says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I love this parenthesis. I must be out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. So he's boasting, but he's also telling him, here's the facts. Yeah, I'm a Hebrew. I'm Abraham's descendant. And I'm a servant of Christ. He says, but listen, middle of verse 23, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in dangers from my fellow Jews, in dangers from Gentiles, in dangers in the city, in dangers in the country, in dangers at sea, and in dangers from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have not gone without and have gone without sleep, excuse me. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily pressure for my concern for all the churches. Paul here is boasting, not out of arrogance or pride. He's making some statements. He says, listen, this is what it means. I was a persecutor. And I'm going to tell you, I've been persecuted. I have been persecuted. And I love the list I just kind of put down, you know, being in prison and pelted with stones, shipwrecked, all these things that had happened to him. And you know what he found out? His words are ringing out. He says, I do this for the love of my churches. You see, he knew the cost. The Apostle Paul knew the cost, and he paid the price. And you know what? It's worth it. I want that heart. I want to have a heart that says, even if I'm exposed to death or beaten or flogged, I want to have passion that the gospel would be proclaimed, that that lives would be forever changed, that people could not have to live in the fear of hell anymore, but could live in the freedom that is provided in Christ. I want that for family church. If you're watching this, I want that for you. I want you to have a passion like this, to, to have a heart that sees the reality that beyond this life, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a part of the kingdom of God, beyond this physical life is nothing but eternity. Eternity with God in the presence of your Creator. Yeah, I want that heart. I want, I want us as a people, a church, to have that heart that nothing will stop us. Nothing. 
And we'll count it as pure joy when we suffer. When people laugh at us, spit at us, when they mock us, we'll, we'll count it as joy because for some reason they must see Jesus in us. I want to start with a promise, though. Oftentimes when we share the gospel, rightly so, we're focused on the awesome blessings of God. I mean, really, eternity with heaven. It's a blessing. It's huge. Peace here on earth. Joy in the middle of circumstances that people would go, what, are you out of your mind? How can you have joy right now? Your family's suffering. Someone is sick. Someone's dying of cancer. How can you have joy? But Jesus made some statements. He said, those are all good things and those are promises as well, but I have some other promises. And today I want to press in to some promises that may not sound as sweet, (laughs) may not sound as joyous. The first one is this, the promise of hardship. Jesus said this in, in John. He says, I have told you these things, speaking of things to come, difficulties to come, so that in me you may have peace, because you're going to need it. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. In this world, you will be in the battle. You will experience trouble. And I promise you, Jesus would say, you will experience hardship. If you truly are going to take up the cross and follow me, yeah, there's blessings. (coughs) excuse me, but there are difficulties. There are hardships. I want to start with a list here just to kind of give you an idea of what it looks like around the world. We're talking today about hardships, the the hardship of persecution. And there's a website called Open Doors, and Open Doors has a list uh, of the top 50 most dangerous places to be a Christian. And on that list, you'll see there's number one is Afghan, or um, excuse me, North Korea. Number two is Afghanistan. And then you go down the list, you see Iran and Sudan. I gave kind of a a sampling because many of those countries that you see are the very areas that we support and pray for missionaries here at Family Church. These are dangerous places to witness for the cause of Christ. I use the word dangerous, though, not difficult, because I think there's a difference. I think it's difficult to share the gospel in the American church, in America. I think it's difficult, but it's not dangerous. And so I want to start with North Korea. In North Korea, the number one most deadly place, in 2013, just as an example, 2013, 80 people over the course of about four weeks were executed publicly. Some of those were simple things like Uh, watching a movie that came out of South Korea. But many of those were the killings of Christians for simply owning a portion of the Bible. Just for owning the Bible. Not preaching the Bible, not proclaiming it, just owning it. Having it in your possession. A couple other things you should know about North Korea. If you are found trying to hold a house church, uh, there's a high chance when caught you will be arrested most likely be in prison. In fact, there's some estimated 50 to 80,000 Christians in prison in labor camps, starvation camps. Some are killed on the spot. But more importantly, even the families of these to the fourth generation suffer that fate as well. So according to this, that would be my children, potentially when my children marry my grandchildren, and potentially when they marry our grandchildren, my great-great-grandchildren. They suffer the same fate. It's a dangerous place. It's a dangerous place to be a Christian. Iran was number eight on the list. This is a picture of 114 arrested in a week. Some of those were released, some were in prison. But here's a little little sample of what it's like to be in Iran. In, In Iran, most people that are Christians will tell you that they hide to read their Bible. So they they hide it in places in their home. Uh, They only have small portions of the Bible, perhaps. They memorize a lot of it. But they hide that. But the the thing that really intrigued me, they said most most of these believers, they don't even tell their young children about 
their faith about what a Christian is for fear that it would slip out. So they wait till their children are in the teenage years where they can hold a secret. Have you lived yet in a, a way in which you fear to just tell your kids about your faith? Not because of what they might say, but because of what could happen through the government around you. I don't think we quite understand what that's like. And, and these are difficult trials. These are difficult. So the question that I ask, and I have to wrestle with, so I'm asking me and I'm asking you is, what do I want? Do I want to live in comfort or do I want to live in the kingdom? See, if I want to live in comfort, then I may evade and avoid places that are dangerous. But if I want to live for the kingdom, then I step into those aware of what God's promise is, that gates of hell will not stand. That when somebody persecutes one of these Christians in Iran or North Korea or Afghanistan or in Roseburg, Oregon, <laughs> what Jesus would say is to them is, you're persecuting me personally. That, that when persecution happens, it is a direct offense to the Savior of the world, the Creator of all, our King. Yeah, it hurts the individual. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to minimize that. But this is a big deal. And God's serious about persecution. There's a second promise. The promise of hatred. I put a crown of thorns in a picture here. Jesus understood hatred. He understood what it was like. And he makes this statement in Matthew. He says, brother will deliver brother over to death. And the father, his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. The gospel is such good news, but it comes with a price tag. You will be hated. Some of you have used this, or I know people perhaps that they've said, oh yeah, people hate me for Jesus' name. And sometimes I go, no, that's just because you're kind of a jerk. You're kind of rude. You're kind of offensive. Not on offense, just offensive. But Jesus says, when you truly love me, when you truly live out for me, remember, they're persecuting me and they will hate you because of me, you will be hated. This is a promise, the promise of hatred. There are lots of places around the world where large gatherings of, of Islamic uh, believers will gather and protest and shout and march against the cross of Christ. This picture here, we've got a cross with a big X over it. Yeah, you will be hated. It's a promise. One, one Christian in Afghanistan, he, he says it this way. He says, how we survive daily, only God knows. He knows because he has been kind to dwell with us. But we are tired of all the death around us. Tired of it. I don't blame him. To convert to faith outside of Islam and, and Iran and many countries is tantamount to treason because it's seen as a betrayal of family, tribe, and country. You see, when, when people convert in difficult areas like this, when they leave the Islamic faith or leave Buddhism or leave uh, some form of spirit worship, even we see this in Cambodia, it is seen as treason or a betrayal against your family or your tribe. It's a betrayal. It's difficult. And so as a result of that, people are persecuted. People are, are outcast from society. Perhaps their economic standing is lost. It is difficult. But here's a question. People in these regions where it's difficult, those Christians who live in regions where persecution is real, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the gospel is spreading faster there than in America. In fact, in Iran, the, the country's government is concerned that the Christian faith is spreading so fast, it may actually have a problem with how they can run their Islamic-based government. In an area where you can't hold church meetings, where oftentimes people are forced to go into rooms where they have to take their cell phones out 
pull the batteries out, place those phones in a different room, cover them with pillows, go into another room, and then whisper scripture to each other. The gospel is spreading double the rate. Three times faster, four times. It's, it's going exponentially faster than we're seeing in the American church. And so I have to ask this question. What would happen if people who have that much passion came to America and had the, the freedom we have? We can worship 24 hours a day. We can go all over the country we want. We can watch videos. We can go stand in a corner and proclaim the gospel. We can read Bibles. We can have Bibles in our houses. Some of you have 10 or more versions. You can pick up your phone. You can have, I don't even know how many translated versions in the YouVersion app. And yet, we find ourselves struggling to see mass excitement and multiplication of the church. But in areas where persecution is, is happening, it's, it's rampage. It's unstoppable. There's a movie. Uh, it's, it's a free kind of YouTube video. There's two versions, or a part one and a part two, I should say. It's called The Sheep Among Wolves. First thing I'll tell you, I would challenge you to watch it. I think it will kind of rattle your senses into what it means to be a committed follower of Christ. When you hear the stories of people in places like Iran sharing what it means to, to share their faith. But I will caution you, it's, it's intense. And it may cause you to, to wonder and question some things in a good way, but you're going to hear them talk about the reality of rape and the reality of beatings and murder. And, and it's tough. It's a tough thing to watch. But what was tougher about it is a statement, and I'll let you watch it and hear this, but it's a story. It's a story of a, a, a man and a woman in a, in a country where they fear for their lives daily, where sometimes they're locked up in their homes for several days in, in a row for fear of what might happen because they're Christians. And, and they lived there for many years and they found themselves the opportunity to come to America. And, the, and for most of us, we'd say, oh man, that's awesome. So they, they come to the U.S. and, and they, they find a place to live. They start working there and they start attending the local church. And, and uh, it wasn't too long and the wife said, Honey, I want to go back. Just that thought, like, what? You, you want to go back? And of course, the husband was like, what do you mean? We're here, look it. And she says, uh, I want to go back. And he says, why? She says, the American church, there is a, she used this word, a satanic slumber. I just don't feel like the church is alive here. I don't, I don't, I don't like it. I, I want to go back. I want to go back to where it was difficult, but I felt alive. I want to go back where it was a struggle, but I felt active. I want to go back where lives were, one, being changed, some being taken, but I saw the church unstoppable. I want to go back. And I just, I can't even fathom that feeling. I don't understand what that's like. And she says, it's like there's this sort of lullaby slumber in the Church of America. And I don't want that to be the truth for us. I don't want us to slumber. I want us to see the battle is real. And, and Pastor Paul, a couple weeks ago, he talked about Elisha, and you can go back and watch that. But just this story of Elisha who prays to basically give people the eyes to see the real battle, the real spiritual battle. And that's a prayer that I hope we all would take seriously so we could engage in the spiritual battle. You see, this lullaby, this satanic lullaby she talked about, I think it's really easy to listen to. And I think the lullaby goes like this. You're saved. God loves you. It's so good. You don't, you don't need to worry about those people over there. And it's okay. Just take your time. Rest. Just rest. Just rest. I think that's kind of the I sort of experience that. I go on went on vacation and I, I came back and I realized how tempting it is to just say, I just kind of want to go. I just want to just go. God loves me. I know that. And I mean, I love him. And boy, it wasn't too long. And I had to rattle my senses and go, no, wait a minute. I'm on mission. That lullaby is so intriguing. It's so tempting. We've talked about two promises that are really tough to swallow. You will be hated. I'm sorry. Jesus said it, not me, so take it up with him. And you know what? There will be hardship, but there's another one. 
says there's a promise of help. Man, I want to spend this last few minutes together in encouragement. I want you to to realize that this persecution is real. But what if I said this right now to you? Persecution is the best thing that happened to the church. Oof. How does that make you feel? That one is a tough one to say. It's easy on this side of persecution, not so easy on the receiving end. But if persecution is proving the gospel is unstoppable in the midst of it, and it's growing faster in the countries where persecution is most evident, man, this promise of help is awesome. Listen to what it says. It says, Jesus again speaking in John 16, he says, Very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Man, people of God, you have received the Holy Spirit, this awesome gift. Jesus is like, I can't hang out here. I'm going to have to go back and prepare a place for you. But don't worry. I'm going to shower the earth with my spirit for those who believe. It's powerful. One of the things we are tempted to do is to avoid persecution. But avoiding persecution is like avoiding the war and hoping you'll still win. You've got to get in the battle. And that's the reality. We are in the battle. We cannot avoid the mission. Otherwise, the mission will not be completed. And it will be completed. The gates of hell will not stand. It is going to happen. The question is, do you want to be a part of it? Man, I love the Apostle Paul's view. I believe he had such a picture of heaven. In fact, let me ask you this real quick. What's your picture of heaven? Just pause for a moment. First of all, what's your picture of hell? Have you ever spent much time thinking about it, or is it kind of one of those taboo mental exercises? When I read Scripture, I read things like gnashing of teeth. I read things about pain and suffering and darkness. I, I like, and I ad lib a little here, but I look at it this way. Take all the pain you've ever experienced, just, just for a moment. Think of the time you were in the most pain, physical, emotional, whatever it was, and then multiply that times infinity, like beyond comprehension pain, and then add on top of that complete separation from God and the knowledge of it, and on top of that, the fact that you know you'll never be in the presence of life again and yet you're somehow living forever with that understanding. That probably is only the the surface of what hell is. And then I read about heaven, where there's no more tears and no more pain and no more weeping and no more sorrow. And more importantly, you're in the presence of the King. You get to exist with God eternally in His presence, His glory, His light, His love forever. I think that's what the Apostle Paul got. I think when Jesus confronted him, I think he got such a picture of heaven, he said, you know what? I'm now a citizen. This planet stuff, it doesn't matter. So I'm going to use it to the best of my ability so others can experience this goodness, this good news, this gospel of truth. Let me read a couple of uh, things that come from a, magazine called Christianity Today. This is good news. Let me tell you a little bit of what they're finding. It says this, despite the fastest growing, or excuse me, despite threatening and horrible things that are happening in places like Iran, specifically, it says it's difficult to determine exactly how many Christians live there, given that most keep their faith secret for fear of persecution. But it's estimated, backed by survey data, that there could be as many as a million Iranian believers. And I said this earlier, that the faith is growing with such, such a spread so fast that there's a concern from policymakers in the government. Oh no, this, this gospel is, is growing too fast. What's going to happen? There's like good things happening and people are nice. <laughs> and, and the next one, it says this, in Afghanistan impossible to assign a precise figure of number of Christians there as well. Nevertheless, the available evidence indicates that Christianity continues to grow, sustained by the existence of an underground church, despite the widespread and intense 
repression faced by Christians. Some report that Christianity has even spread among the elites in the, in the parliament and up in the upper reaches. I could probably spend another two hours, and I'd love to keep you here to listen to that, but there are lists and lists and lists of places like China and North Korea where the gospel is unstoppable. In fact, it's so unstoppable, it is like a steamroller moving forward, and it keeps taking ground. And no matter what gets in the way, it will not be stopped. That's what I want for our church, for the church. That's what I want for my heart and your heart, to see this as unstoppable. Think about it really like this. You won't be willing to give your life for Jesus if you're not willing to live for him. I don't believe you're really going to be willing to give it if you're not willing to live it. It's time to start living for Jesus. It's time to get a picture of heaven that is so profound and so accurate and so full that that is where your hope is because of the goodness of Christ. You can't wait for it, and you will not let that get in the way of anything. Yeah, that's what what I want. I want that heart. I don't care if somebody calls me some weird name because of my faith. If they spit on me or mock me, I want to have the heart that says, all right, cool, I'll consider this this suffering good. And I know that it's really easy to say these things. And man, to those that suffer physical abuse because of their faith, my heart breaks and we need to pray. But I don't think we need to pray for safety. I think we need to pray for perseverance. Lives are at stake. Hell will be taken. Let's get as many people involved in the light of life, in the goodness of God, out of hell before it's taken. Man, I want that. I want that for me. I want that for you. It's powerful. And here's the kind of coming to some closure here. There's this awesome statement. Jesus again speaking in Matthew says, but when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. He says, at that time, you will be given what to say for it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of the Father speaking through you. Man, I remember when we brought our child the very first time we had a a son and we were leaving the hospital. We had read books. We had gone to Lamaz or all these classes and training. We're going to have a child. And then they put the child in the car seat and they said, he's all yours, go home. And I thought, oh no, I don't know how to do this. I think that's Jesus' heart. He said, yeah, you're going to have to build relationship with your child. And it'll be day by day. So what I challenge you is, build your relationship with God. Put your faith in Him. Get into His Word. Read it. Pray regularly. Lift up people. Share all of that. Because when the day comes of persecution, you don't know what it will be for you. But the Holy Spirit will provide what to say and bring the comfort. That moment I talked about with Stephen when he's being stoned, and Saul is approving this. He looks up to heaven and he's like, I see Jesus. I don't think Stephen ran around saying, here, throw rocks at me because someday I'm going to be stoned and I'm going to be ready. No, he built his relationship in faith with Christ. I'm going to finish here. I just want you to look at these faces. These are the faces of the nations. And I'm, I'm impacted by revelations. In, in the book of Revelation, our Bible here, we have God's awesome story But more importantly, we have the end of the story, the spoiler alert. The spoiler alert is the promise is true. The gates of hell will not stand. God wins. You, the church, you win. It's awesome. And here's what it says in Revelation. After this I looked, and there before me, look at these faces. I'm going to bring it up on the screen, full screen. Just look and listen. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every tribe, nation, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. You are fighting a winning battle. You are part of victory. Man, it's awesome. God is so gracious. God is so powerful and so good. And, and, and I want to remember you, remind you of this starfish example. We started the very beginning with the starfish. The starfish can't help but replicate. Man, you cut off a piece of that starfish, and what do you know? Its DNA dictates you're going to have two starfish. 
Church, you're the same way. You are filled with the DNA of the gospel of hope. You have the Holy Spirit and the power of God in you. And when you're persecuted, they're persecuting Jesus. That's who they're persecuting, for his name's sake. I'm going to hand off to our campuses as well as online. I have kind of five key ways that I believe you can get involved in to really live out the life of a gospel-focused Christian. Thanks for joining us today.